question. Last, at the end of last class, I was asked a question that I want to share in, in the whole audience. And that question was, didn't you say you were going to be talking about higher dimensional versions of black hole uniqueness in the last class? Yes. So why are you saying it's not true this class? So maybe I need to clarify what I said by the end of last class. I didn't say black hole uniqueness was false in higher dimensions. It's in fact true, and we'll see that next tomorrow. But Israel's proof of static vacuum black hole uniqueness is not known to generalize to higher dimensions. So why the claim is still correct, the proof doesn't generalize. That's what I was trying to say yesterday, yes? And so the proof we're going to see today, in the way we're going to see it, also does not generalize to higher dimensions. But we'll see tomorrow how you can alter it so it does generalize to higher dimensions. Okay. So, um, so today we're going to talk about a multiple black hole situation. So what was question two and answer two yesterday. And we're going to discuss a proof by Banting and Masudul Alam from 1987, which is 20 years after the proof of Israel that we saw yesterday. And it's much more geometric. Um, it's, it's one of the most beautiful proofs, actually, I know, which in mathematics, which is why I wanted to talk about this topic, because I really like this proof. And it has, played a, has had a tremendous impact on mathematical relativity throughout. So many proofs on, are based on it, or imitate aspects of it, or actually use the result in the way you get it from this theorem. That, like Hugh Bray's proof of the Penrose inequality, Romanian Penrose inequality, for example, wouldn't go without this proof. So that's why it's important for anyone who wants to do mathematical work in general relativity to know this proof. So with this motivation, let me state the theorem. by Banting and Masudul Alam, 1987. And let me say up front that the key ingredient, <coughs> sorry, the key ingredient in this proof is the positive, Romanian positive mass theorem that you've seen last week. Um, so again, we start with a static system, three-dimensional, be static, Vacuum, asymptotic to Schwarzschild um, meaning that the lower order terms are of this form. This is the decay terms are like one over r squared faster to k faster than 1 over r squared. The first derivative is like 1 on r cubed, and the second derivative is like 1 over r to the 4. This is what this notation means. It's just for those people who want to know the precise decay of the lower order term of mass m. And again, they assume positivity of that mass to begin with, but there are modern, more modern methods where you don't need to assume it to begin with, but Today, I'll gloss over those with inner boundary, which is now potentially disconnected. So it consists of finitely many sigma 2i, sigma 2i connected static horizon. And i big or equal to 1, then i is 1, and the, spa the corresponding space-time is isometric to Schwarzschild. Of the same mass. Yes. 
So we can potentially have multiple black hole horizons to begin with, but eventually we'll only have one and everything will be short-shield, as we discussed last time. Oh, and sorry, this would be an S, of course. This was going to happen. Okay. And I'll write the remark. Um, one can drop the assumption that M be positive uh, by a maximum principle argument, which I'm not going to explain here because I'm not sure everyone knows maximum principles. Okay, and recall from last class that we already know that sigma 2i is totally geodesic, has mean curvature zero by assumption, and also the trace free part of the mean curvature is, is of the second fundamental form vanishes, and also the normal derivative of the lapse is a constant for each i, not necessarily the same constant for each i and actually is a positive constant, again, by the maximum principle, for those of you who know what that means. We discussed this last class for a single black hole horizon carefully. Okay, so now comes the idea of the proof and I'll do a lot of it in pictures. I'll only do those computations explicitly where I think one can learn something from the computation or otherwise the proof is not clear if one doesn't do the computation. Okay. So here's the idea. The first step is that we double the manifold. So we have our asymptotically flat, oh, there's not enough room here. Um, we have our asymptotically flat manifold with potentially several horizons. So this will be sigma 2, 1, and this will be sigma 2, 2. And this is where s goes to infinity, and here as well. And this is m3. So the first step, what we're going to do, and we did this explicitly in the case of Schwarzschild before, is we're going to reflect it through the horizon and have a second copy and call, and call this M3 tilde. And we're also going to copy the coordinates that we have near infinity and calling them Xi tilde and S tilde, the radius. So here we have coordinates Xi tilde and the radius S tilde that goes to infinity. So up here, we have our asymptotically flat coordinates xi, okay? And because the surfaces are all totally geodesic, so the second fundamental form vanishes completely, we can do this here without having a crack, okay? The first derivative is actually a line. This is due to this condition, this, this assertion here. So the regularity at the gluing here will be C11, where C11 means it's C1, so with the continuous first derivatives, and the second comma one means the highest order derivative is Lipschitz continuous. If you don't know what that means, it's not so important for the rest of the proof. If you do know what it means, that's the regularity we have on all these surfaces. Apart from the surfaces, we're smooth. I mean, the manifold you can think of smooth anyway. And we, in addition, we have the metric, and we also just copy the metric um, down here, and then everything is, has this nice regularity here. The second derivative could jump, but the first derivative is actually continuous, okay? Which is because the second fundamental form vanishes, so in some sense this is, could be used as a reflection symmetry plane or surface. So that's the first step. We double M3 and G. And then we glue them together, so we have M3 hat to be M3 
together with M3 twiddle. And of course, we identify the boundaries and we only count them once. And we have g hat to be g on M3 and g twiddle on M3 twiddle. And now we want to do something similar for the lapse function. Here we also have our lapse function n. And down here we want to have hello, a lapse function n twiddle so that together we can combine them to a lapse function n hat. And our definition of n twiddle of a point p twiddle will be minus n of p. What does that mean? If we have a point p twiddle down here, because this is a double, this means it's a reflection copy of a point p up here. This we can plug in into n, take minus of it, and call it the lapse of this point p twiddle. And then we combine them to get n hat to be n on m3 and n twiddle on m3 twiddle. Okay? So then means now on the whole thing, we have a manifold, we have a metric which is smooth except on these surfaces where it has this regularity and we also have a function. And now let's think about this function. Of course, the function is smooth up here and smooth down there. What does the function do across these? Well, it becomes zero there. So changing it from plus to minus doesn't matter, makes it continuous. And if you look at the condition that nu of n is a positive constant here, you can actually make this uh, equivalent, uh, interpret this as being equivalent to make, being able to merge this function n and n twiddle c11 here as well. Okay? So the conditions here are exactly what we need to merge these two pieces together along the horizons in a C11 fashion, which is exactly smooth enough for what we want to do later. And this is also exactly what happens. We didn't talk about the lapse function in detail in the isotropic Schwarzschild picture, where we double Schwarzschild. This is exactly the same thing that happens there. On the, on the new, on the copy, we have a negative lapse function in the Schwarzschild case as well. So in, if we had started with Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, with half Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, we would now have complete Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates. If we had Schwarzschild, just a second, if we had started with Schwarzschild in different coordinates, which are only asymptotic to the isotropic coordinates, we would still have double Schwarzschild just in funny coordinates. Yes? It could be C infinity on the boundary also. I think that's something one typically assumes. Yeah? But here, all we need is, is that it matches C11. So then, then uh, we could have assumed that from the beginning. Um, we don't know anything about the second derivative across the surface in this reflection procedure. End of story. We just don't know a priori. A posteriori, we're going to know it's Schwarzschild, and then, of course, it's smooth. But a priori, we don't. So that's, but that's all we're, we're going to need to prove it's Schwarzschild. OK? Good. So now let's think about the asymptotics for a second. Here we know that it's asymptotic to Schwarzschild as s goes to infinity. Then the metric here is going to look exactly the same as s twiddle goes to infinity. And the lapse function is going to look like minus 1 plus m over s, s twiddle, instead of 1 minus. OK? So that's, that's natural. And the next step, what we're going to do now, I'm going to erase this here, hoping that everyone already copied it. So I have room for more pictures. Now we're going to perform a conformal change. <coughs> From this scenario where we now we have here m3 hat, um, g hat, and n hat, to a scenario here where we'll have m3, I don't know how to call that, wedge maybe, g wedge and n wedge. Oh, no n wedge. 
M, M, wedge, M3 hat, wedge and G hat, which will be conformally related to this in the same sense that if I started here with Schwarzschild, then doubled it to double Schwarzschild, and then perform this conformal change, I would get flat space, only I would get flat space without the origin in Schwarzschild, right? So I want to do something that if I started, if this is Schwarzschild, then this would be R3 without the origin and the Euclidean metric. Okay? So what was the formula in Schwarzschild? The formula was that this metric here was f a function phi to the power of 4 delta. So to go here, I want to multiply by phi to the power minus 4 <laughs> to get delta. Okay, so I want g wedge to be some function phi to the power minus 4 times g hat. So in, in case I started with Schwarzschild and I picked phi to be the function I wanted in Schwarzschild, then I get delta back. But now I need to say what phi is in general. And actually, even if I was in the Schwarzschild case, I don't know if my Schwarzschild is written in isotropic coordinates. So then I don't know if this function takes exactly the same form in, in the variable s as it did in Schwarzschild. So I need to find a way to write this without appealing to coordinates if I can, yeah? Um, and the idea is the following. Look at Schwarzschild, maybe I'll do that here. And this is a cool idea that's been used in other scenarios as well, but I think it has been tremendously underused. Is there a question? Is, do you have a question? There's something you can't read? Or? What is this one? Oh, this is the trace free part of the second fundamental form. So if we were in Schwarzschild, we would know in, in, in isotropic coordinates. Then we would know that phi of s is 1 plus m over 2s, and n of r was 1 minus 2m over r, and r was phi of s squared times s. And this allows us to look at n of r of s, as Marcello suggested to call it, and call, we'll call this n hat of s in the Schwarzschild case, just as over there. And this you can compute to be 1 minus m over 2s divided by 1 plus m over 2s. So the lapse function that reads like this in the r variable reads like that in the s variable in conformal coordinates, isotropic coordinates. And now, the cool idea that they had was to introduce a function phi of n hat, not of a variable, not of a coordinate, but of this function as um, 2 over 1 plus n hat. Um, and if you do that, then what you get is that in Schwarzschild, phi of s is nothing than phi of n hat of s. Okay? So this is rewriting the same thing over and over again in different ways. So I'll, I'll repeat, we have this conformal factor that we computed for Schwarzschild. We have the lapse function that we wrote down for Schwarzschild. We write this lapse function in isotropic coordinates. It's the same physics, it's just written differently in different coordinates. And then instead of expressing it in terms of s or r, now we express this function little phi in terms of a function of n hat, which then is a function of s. 
So then we, we can express this phi of s in the Schwarzschild scenario as this capital phi applied to this n hat. Okay? And this we can do here, where phi is this capital phi applied to n hat, or in other words, is 2 over 1 plus n hat. Okay? This is just an algebraic, an algebraic trick in the Schwarzschild example, but in general, it allows us to write something which completely is independent of coordinates. So even if we worked in Schwarzschild but in different sets of coordinates where the phi would take a different form, um, this would still be true. So we've peeled the physics out of the coordinate expressions or the math or the geometry or whatever you want to call it. We've peeled it out of the coordinate representation of everything. Now we manage to write this conformal change in a Schwarzschild scenario like this. And of course, no one stops us from just performing a conformal transformation like this and see what happens. Okay? So that's what we do. We define our g wedge to be phi to the minus 4 g hat and actually our m3 wedge to be just m3 hat. So we don't change the manifold at all. We just change the metric on this manifold. And in, that, uh, in a conformal way, with a conformal factor that we can compute from the lapse function. OK, in order to do that, of course, we need to verify that this phi never becomes 0, which is obvious, but and also never becomes infinity, which is fine, because n is between 0 and 1. And then n hat is between minus 1 and plus 1. And that's OK. Yes? Because I want, this is the manifold with boundary, and this is another copy of the same manifold with boundary. Now I glue them along the boundary, so I want to have a name for the manifold without boundary, for the total manifold. Okay? And in fact, one thing you can observe about this manifold is that it's geodesically complete. Okay, this here is geodesically complete. Not important for the proof, but. Okay, and now I perform this conformal change. So I don't know how to draw it yet because I don't know the asymptotics yet. So I'm not going to draw it before we figured out the asymptotics. But before we figure out the asymptotics, well, let's figure out the asymptotics first. Why not? Um, Asymptotics. So as I said, here we just have the asymptotics of M3G, and N has the asymptotics we assumed. Yeah? G and N, G, G I J is like 1 plus M over 2S to the power 4 delta ij plus lower order terms, and n is like 1 minus m over s plus lower order terms as s goes to infinity. Now let's look at phi to the minus 1, because we're going to need phi to the minus 4. So I'm starting with phi to the minus 1. That is 1 plus n hat and in this case, 1 plus n over 2. 1 plus n over 2 with this asymptotics is like 1 minus m over 2s plus lower order terms. So then g wedge ij is phi to the minus 4 g ij is like 1 minus m over 2s plus lower order terms to the power 4 times 1 plus m over 2s to the power 4 delta ij plus lower order terms. OK? I've just multiplied the formula I found for this to the power 4 with this formula. Now, a, like, if you have something like this, you can compute it like a binomial, and then you get 1 minus m over 2s to the power 4 plus lower order terms. But 1 minus m over 2s 
times, times 1 plus m over 2 is, is also binomial and gives you 1 plus something of the order 1 over s squared. So no 1 over s term. So this completely reads like, and I'll write it in a suggestive, suggestive notation, uh, 1 plus 0 over 2 s to the power 4 delta ij plus lower order terms. Okay, so the G wedge, the new metric I get up here in this infinite end looks like asymptotic to Schwarzschild of mass zero. Okay. So I can now try to draw that. So after this conformal change, M3, well, the northern half here, G ha wedge, um, I, I'll not write anything there. I write it on top. Um, so it would still be asymptotic to Schwarzschild, but now of a different mass, namely mass zero. Recall, if this was Schwarzschild, that would be Euclidean space. So mass zero is very consistent. Yeah. So in some sense, asymptotically, for any such metric, the same magic happens as in, as, as in the Schwarzschild case, only just asymptotically, we kill the mass. Okay. Okay, so what happens at the other end? So this is the, what they call the northern half. So now let's look at the southern half, or the double. Of course, the metric has the same asymptotics as before because we just reflected it. But the left function now has the opposite sign. So it will be like minus 1 plus m over s. So g triddle ij looks like 1 plus m over 2s to the power 4 delta ij plus lower order terms. Oh, s twiddle. And n twiddle will look like minus 1 plus m over s twiddle plus lower order terms as s twiddle goes to infinity. Now then if I compute my little phi minus 1, that'll be 1 plus n twiddle over 2. This doesn't look as nice anymore because the 1 and the minus 1 cancel. Okay, and instead you get m over 2s twiddle plus lower order terms. That means that this conformal factor goes to 0, not to 1 anymore in this end. Okay? So it will do something tremendously diff different. So here in this end, the conformal transformation just pulled everything even more flat. In this end, it will do something different. It multiplies it with something that asymptotically becomes 0. That's not so surprising either, because if we started with Schwarzschild, then the lower end would fold in and would be R3 around the origin. So we can expect that something like that happens too. And in order to observe that, it's a useful idea to introduce a different set of coordinates that allows us to study something near a point rather than near infinity. OK, but let's first write down what would Gij look like. G wedge ij would look like um, g to the minus 4 g twiddle ij. And that is, it would look like 
m over 2 s twiddle to the power 4, which is what we've just computed, delta ij plus lower order terms. Okay, so it looks like something that goes to zero. That's not good for a Riemannian metric. Yes. Because that's what happens in Schwarzschild. If you look at isot the isotropic or the, the conformal Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, then the Laps function is positive up here and negative up here. We call the Kuskal diagram I drew last time, right, on inside the black hole. It, on the other side, on the other exterior, it has the opposite sign because time changes. I mean, yeah? That's why I'm doing it here, because I want to do exactly the same thing that happens in Schwarzschild, because I want to recover Schwarzschild, right? If I did anything else, I'd be doomed. <coughs> so here we are with the pro faced with the problem that the matrix looks like this. If we were exactly Schwarzschild, there just wouldn't be any lower order terms. Okay, it would also look like this. So now we introduce new coordinates. And like this, we take the coordinate xi to be m squared over 4 times xi twiddle over s twiddle squared. So what does that mean? Here we had the coordinate xi with radius s, and we decided to call them xi twiddle and s twiddle down here. Okay, that's what xi twiddle and s twiddle are. So I take the ith new coordinate is the ith old coordinate divided by its length squared and multiplied by this number. Geometrically, what this means, if you're in Euclidean space, and you have a sphere of radius m over 2, we call in isotropic coordinates, that's the radius of the horizon. Then this is an inversion in the sphere in the following sense. If you have the origin here, and you take a ray, and you take a point here, then there is something called an inversion in the sphere, which is like a reflection in the sphere, that you can take a point from the outside to the inside, and vice versa. This, if you perform this twice, you get the identity. So it, it has all the features of a reflection in some sense. And if you then instead, if you know this, then it has this formula if, it, if you take the unit sphere. But now we want to take the sphere, which is the horizon, so the sphere of radius m over 2, and then you get this formula. So this is the inversion in the sphere. And if you think of this as being exactly Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, then we said the northern half and the southern half are isometric, and there is a reflection, and this is exactly the coordinate change you would perform to the isotropic coordinates to swap the, the southern and the northern half. Okay, so that's, that's where this idea comes from. And then we do a computation, um, namely that, uh, I, I, and we introduce capital S as capital XI squared plus capital X2 squared plus capital X3 squared. So the Euclidean radius in this new R3. So now we wrote R3 without the or origin in different coordinates. And this is our new radius. It's, and we can relate the old and the new radius by seeing that the, the um, new radius is m squared over 4 times s twiddle. So this is how the length of these vectors changes under this inversion. And then we can compute the differential dx i twiddle as being nothing else than m squared over 4 dx capital I minus 2 capital X i over s squared. Wait, there is an s squared missing here, and s or xk d capital xk. This is chain rule, okay? This is chain rule applied to the inverse of this formula. And now that I have this, let me write, oh, sorry, I want to understand this metric, so I write g wedge as what we've computed, m over 2s to the power 4 
delta ij plus lower order terms dx y i twiddle dx j twiddle. This is what this really means to write it like this, yes? And now I've got a formula that allows me to take this S and transform it into a capital S via this formula. Oh, this should be an S twiddle, sorry. Um, and take the dxi twiddle and dxj twiddle and replace them by this, okay? To transform this metric into these new coordinates. And I'll need to erase something before I can write this anywhere. So you do a computation, and what you get is delta i and j plus, and now it's not lower order terms anymore, but higher order terms, because now we're inverting the radius. So instead of taking s twiddle to infinity, we're taking capital S to zero. So it's higher order terms. dx capital I, dx capital J. And there is a D wedge when we started. Okay? In other words, if I take G wedge and plug in D capital X I, D capital X J, then I get delta I J plus higher order terms as capital S goes to zero. Okay, so let's look at this formula once more. There was an S twiddle in here. We take this S twiddle and replace it through this formula by a capital S. So it will be like capital S to the four times some um, M's and so on. Uh, no, all M's go away, capital S to the four. And then this S squared here and this S squared four actually kill this S to the four. Okay. If I did this precisely, exactly in Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates, I wouldn't get any higher order terms, and I would have recovered the flat metric. Okay. So let's draw that. Hello. So what happens is that this asymptotic Schwarzschildian end gets bent in the same way the southern end of the Schwarzschild band gets bent in to something which looks like almost flat space with one missing point. If it was Schwarzschild, it would be just R3 without the origin. And we can glue in a point P infinity to close this off geodesically completely. So we glue in this one point, and in fact, one can do this glue in as was verified by this computation, if you track the higher order terms more carefully, also so that the regularity here is C11. And now the new thing, so then M3 wedge union this P infinity together with the metric G wedge extended by the flat metric into this point is geodesically complete. Just like R3, which is Schwarzschild, R3 minus the origin after you glue in the origin is geodesically complete. Yes. It is capital S going to zero, yes. So the important thing we've achieved by this gluing in of this one point is that our resulting thing is geodesically complete. And if we were Schwarzschild, we had started with Schwarzschild, it would just be R3 delta. Any questions for this computation before I raise it? Yes. 
Um, no linear, I think. This magic with the one term that's missing, that's happening in the other end, doesn't happen here because, because of this cancellation of the one and minus one. So we, we lose one order. Okay. Okay, so now we've produced a geodesically complete manifold, which has the same topology as before the, geodesic, uh, before the conformal change, except we glued in this one point. And it has an asymptotic, uh, one end, it's asymptotic Schwarzschildian with one end that has mass zero. So M wedge three united with P infinity, G wedge is asymptotic to Schwarzschild, or asymptotically Schwarzschildian of mass zero. We've already computed that, but I want to write it down in words. Okay. And now, if we were Schwarzschild, we would also be flat completely, yes? Of course, in general, we won't expect to be able to show that a priori that this is flat, because then we would be pretty done. We need more steps. Instead, what we want to do is we want to use this magical positive mass theorem in the Riemannian case, the positive energy theorem or Riemannian positive mass theorem, whatever you want to call it, that says if you have a geodesically complete manifold, we do, which is asymptotically flat of mass zero. We have even more than that, asymptotic to Schwarzschild of mass zero. And it has non-negative scalar curvature, then it has to be Euclidean space. There's a little bit of subtleties because it says and it is smooth, but let's discuss that later. Okay, so now let's compute the scalar curvature of this to see whether it's non-negative. PMT is the positive mass theorem, okay? The, so this is the, really the rigidity case, the positive mass theorem. So how do we compute that? Well, we have a formula for G wedge, right? So G wedge and G wedge was phi to the minus four of G hat. And G hat was really just G in two copies. So we can compute our wedge. Um, so this is a conformal transformation and we can use we can use the formula for conformal change of the scalar curvature to deduce exactly what is the conformal, uh, what is the scalar curvature, okay? And the formula there is such that I never remember it. It's R of G hat. And this way round turns out to be more useful. It's phi to the minus, must be typo, I think seven or something like that. Um, R G wedge um, minus eight Laplacian G wedge phi over phi. Okay. So the scalar curvature of the old metric can be computed or expressed in the scalar curvature of the new metric, and this is the Laplacian of our conformal factor phi in terms of the new metric G wedge. But this we know is zero from the static equations. One of them was scalar flat. 
Okay, so now that means we know that our new scalar curvature R wedge is eight times the Laplacian of phi with respect to the new metric over phi. Okay, that doesn't tell us much yet about the sign of it. Okay, but we can compute this because we know what phi is. We call that phi was really two over one plus n hat. Now, the same way that there are formulas for conformal change of the scalar curvature or the transformation of scalar curvature under conformal change, there's also formulas for the transformation of Laplacian upon a conformal change of the metric. And the formula reads like this, for any function f, which is smooth enough, we have that Laplacian with respect to g wedge of f can be computed as phi to the four Laplacian g hat of f minus two over phi Laplacian, oh no, sorry, d phi applied to the gradient of f with respect to the metric g hat. Okay, so the Laplacian with respect to the new metric of any function f is the conformal factor to the power of four, the Laplacian with respect to the old metric of f minus two over f, d phi applied to the gradient in the old, gradient in the old metric. Now we need to apply this to phi. And then we get Laplacian of g wedge applied to phi is phi to the power four, the old Laplacian of phi minus two over phi d phi squared in the old metric. Then another nice formula is, in fact, that this part here in the, in the bracket, by a straightforward computation, is nothing else than the Laplacian with respect to the old metric of phi minus one, which is one over phi and not the inverse function, <laughs> okay? If you compute the Laplacian of one over a function, what you get is Laplacian of that function minus two over phi some times some power, uh, phi to the mi minus two. Sorry, phi to the minus two. Okay? So now what we got is that Laplacian of phi with respect to our new metric, which is what we need to understand the scalar curvature, of the new metric is minus phi squared Laplacian of phi to the power minus one in the old metric. Recall that phi was two over one plus n. So that means that phi to the minus one is one plus n over two. So what this is is minus phi squared Laplacian of g hat um, sorry, n hat, um, one plus n hat over two. Now this is really nice because of course the Laplacian over one is always zero, yes? Where's the minus sign coming from? Probably I missed one here, thank you. Um, everything is going to be zero in a second, so it's not that bad, but, <laughs> but thank you anyway. So if I have the Laplacian, Laplacian is a linear operator, so the, then I can compute it separately for the one half and the n hat over two. The Laplacian of a constant is of course zero. So what I remain with this here is really one half of the Laplacian of g hat of n hat. Now recall on the northern half, g hat and n hat are just g and n. So this is the Laplacian of n, and n was harmonic, so this is zero. On the southern half, g hat was g, and n hat was minus n. So the same argument applies. So by the static equations, 
this is zero. I'll go through the computation once more in a second. So we get that the Laplacian of B with respect to G wedge is zero. Now look at this. The scalar curvature of the new metric was proportional to this Laplacian. So that means the scalar curvature of the new metric vanishes as well. So it's scalar flat. So we write here M wedge union P infinity G wedge this has R wedge equals zero. And now I've lied to you the whole time because everything is not smooth on the gluing surfaces and on this point P infinity. So now I'm, I'm writing where smooth enough. So away from this one point where we may not have enough regularity and away from these two surfaces or finitely many surfaces where we not, may not enough, have enough regularity to even compute the scalar curvature which involves second derivatives, here and here, so to say, we are scalar flat. So we do satisfy the assumption of the positive mass theorem except being smooth. Now if we were smooth, which if we had started with Schwarzschild we would be smooth, the positive mass theorem would now tell us, okay, then this is globally isometric to Euclidean space. There is a weak version, and this positive mass theorem, as you've heard last week, is proven by Shane and Yao in, in 1979 and 81, and by Witten in, in, in 71, uh, 81, sorry, 81, <laughs> a little bit ahead. Um, and there was a version of Witten's proof for weak regularity manifolds already in 1986 by Robert Bartnick, which is one year prior to this. Still, they gloss over this and they just say, okay, now we apply the rigidity case of the positive math theorem by Shane and Yao and by Witten, and then everything is Euclidean space. But in fact, they could have just cited Bartnick with his low regularity um, spinner proof, so Witten style proof of the positive mass theorem and said, okay, this is enough regularity to apply Robert Bartnick's result of the rigidity case of the positive mass theorem and conclude that this is actually really globally isometric to Euclidean space with the isometry being smooth here and here and of C11 regularity here and here and at this point. Okay, so I'll write some of this down. Um, Oh, I said I walked you through this again, so I'm not going to erase it. So I'll write it here. Um, rigidity case of positive mass theorem in weak regularity. By Robert Bartnick. 1986, and I wrote down the citation somewhere like this. Here. Um, this is the mass of an asymptotically flat manifold. and it appeared in Communications on Pure and Applied Mathematics in 1960, in 1986, in, on pages um, 661 through 693. <clears throat> Okay, so let me walk you through this computation once more, just in case I lost you previously. We've computed before that the manifold is asymptotically Schwarzschildian of mass 
zero up here, and that here we can glue in one point to make it closed and geodesically complete. And then we looked at the scalar curvature. We used a formula from conformal geometry that tells us how the scalar curvature of a manifold is related to the scalar curvature of really conformally changed manifold. This allowed us to conclude, because we knew from the static equations that the original manifold was scalar, scalar flat, that the new scalar curvature is proportional to the Laplacian of the function phi with respect to the new metric. Then we computed, or I told you a formula, how to transform the Laplacian of a function with respect to a conformally transformed metric in terms of the old metric. And we plugged in f equals phi and realized that the term we get here is, is nothing else than proportional to the Laplacian of 1 over phi, which is very nice because 1 over phi is a constant plus something proportional to our lapse function. And because the Laplacian is uh, linear, we can compute it as just the Laplacian of the lapse function, or Laplacian of minus the lapse function on the southern end of our thing. And this, according to the static equation, is zero, which means we've concluded that it's scalar flat. The new metric is also scalar flat, okay? Yes? I, w I would think so, and I, I think it's better to discuss this after tomorrow's lecture. <laughs> um, I'm not saying I'm going to prove that tomorrow, but I'm not, not the weak case. But so, for, so maybe, maybe it's worth a comment now that you ask. So we've got this equation, and all that we've done, that we're doing now using this equation is to conclude that the scalar curvature vanishes of the new metric. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you an alternative proof of, of, of what's going to come now of the closing argument of the bunting masurula lam proof, where instead of using only scalar flat, we also exploit this equation much more, okay? which allows us to generalize it to higher dimensions. But today, somehow, Banting and Masood, they don't explicitly write it like this. They somehow use it implicitly just in the computation of the scalar curvature, and then they say, okay, now we know it's scalar flat, and they forget about this fact. At least that's how I read it. Um, okay, so now, thanks to Bartnick, and Bartnick's generalization of Witten's proof of positive mass theorem of rigidity, we know that our resulting manifold is precisely R3. So positive mass theorem rigidity and low regularity. Let's say low enough regularity. I'm not claiming that you can't prove it in lower regularity. Regularity tells us that M3 wedge union P infinity, G wedge is globally isometric to R3 delta. Just for those of you who are interested, so far we have not made use of dimensions except that we're using here. Um, the positive mass theorem, but actually Bartnick's version is n-dimensional. So up to now, everything is, works fine n-dimensionally. Yes? Did he? Really? Okay, I'll check to, for tomorrow. Remind me after the class, please. Um, I, I don't know, but definitely there is higher, by now we have higher dimensional versions of Witten's proof in low regularity by uh, Lee and Lefloc for sure with 
not no more than the necessary um, assumptions. And also, of course, we have a high regularity Shane and Yao proof in higher dimensions, which I'm sure you've heard about last week, uh, or I think so. Um, but so we do have the theorems, and I, I thought that this was fine, but I'll check again. Um, so this globally isometric. So now we are globally isometric. So now this weird thing turns out to be flat Euclidean space. Okay. So this guy is in fact globally isometric to R3 delta, where the I I isometry could potentially be of lower regularity here and here, as well as here, and is smooth everywhere else. So now we need to recover, why is that helping us to know that we've been Schwarzschild to begin with? Okay, okay, now we're in the same situation if, where we are in Schwarzschild, but what, why does that help us? And there are actually a number of different arguments how to do that, and I'm not going to go into much detail, but in the original, so Bunting and Masood, at this point, uh, um, site work by Robinson, or actually already present in this paper of Miller, Tim Hagen, and Robinson and Seifert that I cited yesterday, Robinson and Seifert, should be 1972, um, where they use the cotton York tensor, which I'm going to write down in a second, from conformal geometry. to conclude, uh, plus the static vacuum equations, to conclude with Schwarzschild. That we started with Schwarzschild. Okay, so this argument is not due to Bunting and Masood, it's been there before just to give everybody proper credit. So the Cotton York tensor This is for n equals three. This is the point where this becomes a three-dimensional proof. Okay, the Cotton York tensor is a tensor defined as a derivative of a Ricci. I'll write it down in a second. So it's a third-order differential operator, and it sort of plays the role of the Weyl tensor in higher dimensions. So you know probably that from dimension four and higher, the Weyl tensor is zero if a metric is conformally flat. In three dimensions, the tensor that plays this role is the Cotton York tensor. And in fact, there is a theorem by Eisenhardt saying that it's conformally flat if and only if the Cotton York tensor vanishes, but we're not going to need that. So the Cotton York tensor C is defined, that is most easily defined in abstract index notation. So it's two nabla i bridge G. J, K, plus one half, G, K, of course not like this, K, I, Nabla, J, R. R is the scalar curvature, Rick is the Ricci curvature, and C is the Cotton York tensor, and the brackets are anti symmetrization with a factor one half. Okay? Okay, that's the cotton tensor, so it's a third order differential operator, and the cotton tensor C vanishes 
if um, G is conformally flat. Actually, I forgot to say that if you didn't know any of these conformal geometry formulas, it would, of course, be a good exercise to verify them, the, the scalar curvature. And also, this is a nice exercise to do if you, don't, if you want to get more familiar with conformal geometry. So what Miller, Tim Hagen, and Robinson, and Seifert do next is they take the cotton tensor, which involves the Ricci, the scalar curvature in the metric, and of course, covariant derivatives, and plug in the Ricci equation from the static equations. So we had n times the Ricci was the Hessian of n. You can write this as Ricci ij is 1 on n Hessian ij of n. And we know that the scalar curvature is 0. This was our static equations. And you can plug them into the cotton tensor. And then you get a formula that the cotton tensor is such and such and such in terms of the metric and the laps and derivatives of the laps. Okay? So C is then C of n, d, n, probably up to third derivatives, and g. And is 0 because we have already shown that we are conformally flat. And then what they do is go back to this Israel idea of looking at the level sets of the lapse function. Of course, a tensor that's zero everywhere is also zero on each level set. And then they conclude from this formula here that is lengthy that each level set has constant n to begin with by definition and constant mean curvature and vanishing trace free part of the second fundamental form. So it's umbilic. It has constant um, Gauss curvature and so on and so forth. So we cover all the identities we did yesterday in a different way and then close the argument like Israel did by explicit computation of, of Schwarzschild. So we have the cotton tensor. This implies that each n equals constant, which yesterday we called them sigma 2n, is as yesterday. So I put it in quotes round and mean intrinsically and extrinsically, and then an ex same explicit computation as yesterday. And it shows you that you're short yield. Okay. Um, so this is where this proof became three-dimensional, because we used the cotton tensor, and the cotton tensor doesn't have the same nice conformal property in higher dimensions. However, there is an argument by it plays the role of the vial tensor, but the vial tensor has a different formula, a completely different formula. Yeah, it's a part of the Riemann tensor, right? So it has two derivatives. This has three derivatives. So it, it has the same spirit, but it's not the same thing. OK. So, but you're thinking in the right direction, because Huang, and I'll write down the reference next class. I forgot to bring it. Um, or I can look at it. No, I cannot. Uh, I'll bring it next class. Huang, in, um, I think, two, in 1980, 1998 or something like that, proved the same thing in higher dimensions. So all the first part I said it was immediately higher dimensional except all the numbers 4 get replaced by 4 over n minus 2 and so on. And he found a way of using the vial tensor here instead of the cotton tensor to make it higher dimensional. I'll mention this again tomorrow. Okay? So there is a version of this recovery of Schwarzschild argument using the vial tensor, which is a little bit more involved than the original Cotton-York tensor argument but has the same conclusion in higher dimensions by Wang. And um, maybe I'll just close here for today. Thank you.